Okay, now we've been listening to cars and automotive stuff all morning. And last year it was more into vessels and things that float and made huge things made out of steel. So uh, I understand the automotive thing. Um, and it's actually, I've got a 18% exposure into automotive of various kinds. Uh, the Landy case I really enjoy because the biggest position I have is in hexagon composites, which makes the uh, tanks for the cars. And I fully agree to what's going on there. Anyway, now we change the scene slightly into a, a very different stable earner. Um, just briefly, the fund uh, launched only a few months ago. It's a uh, fund house. Advice Capital is a fund house that is 10 years old. Uh, it's a small entity so far. I could get into the fund without paying for it because they were closing it down. So I took it over. And it's assigned the same way as the Warren Buffett Partnership Fund from 1956. So there's a zero uh, fixed fee, 20% performance fee, absolute return, high watermark. Very simple. And focusing into uh, roughly uh, 20 stocks that all have some growth characteristics and profitability characteristics that support the long-term uh, absolute return uh, strategy. You can uh, read this. But um, I forgot one thing when I did this the other day. Uh, last week, I became chairman of the uh, Danish Shareholder Society, which is an entity like this, just much bigger, 13,000 members, uh, 25,000, including the passive ones that are not really paying for it, but actually 13,000 active members. And there's now a new journey to start where, you know, as a chairman, you don't have to do all the daily work, but I have to inspire that we have an even more professional investment environment in Denmark going forward, scaled on what I can see going on in Sweden and the US on the same kind of uh, structures. Just before I start on the, on the case itself, uh, I've been investing long enough to know that everybody can make 8 to 10% returns every year. That's in the past. That was supported by solid revenue growth. But if you look at what's going on for the time being, and what I see for the next uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 years is that we live in a world where the growth rates are coming down to much more moderate levels than what, we, what we're used to. When I was born, there was 3 billion people on the planet. Today, there's 7.5 billion, roughly. So the population growth or the workforce growth is actually declining. Profitability, sorry, uh, productivity is declining too. Inflation is not much to speak of. So what I see going forward is that we're moving into a world where we have nominal growth of around 4%. So the investment returns of 8 10%, you should uh, calibrate your expectations down to closer to 4 to 5%, plus the risk you take and the timing you're good at. But uh, that's the framework for how I think going forward. Then identifying industries that long term will grow more. There's one interesting area. All these seven and a half billion people, they need something to eat on a daily basis. Pro proteins are in big demand. So, um, and that's expected to grow faster than the GDP. Depending on how you Google it and what scientific entity you ask, it's uh, three to four percent growth in uh, protein going forward. And there's one protein which is not that CO2 uh, extensive, is X. If you start in the high end of what uses a lot of CO2, it's the, uh, the sheep and lambs, and then comes the cow, then comes pigs, salmon, and then chickens and eggs, eggs in the very low end. So it's a good form for uh, proteins, and it's very healthy. I can only suggest that all of us eat three eggs a day. And it's not dangerous for your cholesterol if you live uh, otherwise healthy. So just a few things. On the planet Earth, there's obviously, since chickens come out of the ground very fast and can start be egg-laying hens, the statistics are not very good in emerging markets. But uh, according to the Global Egg Association, we eat 1.5 trillion eggs a year. There's 7 billion egg-laying hens uh, at work. And it's a terrible business because if you by coincidence, if you're a Buddhist and think you come back as an egg-laying hen, it's a very sad destiny because you live, on average, 18 months. You lay all these eggs. 
and you don't eat those afterwards. You make them into a mold that you mix up in concrete and make much better cement. That's a very trist, a very sad destiny, but that's the, uh, that's the way we use chickens in this very industrialized world we live in. Just a few facts. Uh, Brun Hartmann, they are more into the uh, packaging needs. And uh, when I've been looking into investments for the last, last many years, I always thought that use all this plastic waste when I go to the supermarket is a waste of time and money and resources. So I was early into Tomma, the bottle recycling company in Norway. I took on a position in, uh, in, uh, in the soda stream because then you have, don't have to buy soda in the supermarket and bring the bottles back or throw them out. You just recycle and use your tap water. Both of those have worked out very fine. On average, they're up uh, 10, or 10 times the money in multi-year periods. Then I've been looking into other kinds of businesses that could benefit from this non-plastic world, and there's not that many coming up. You have uh, Westrock in the US, you have Bilul Korsnes in Sweden, and then I think Hartmann is the one that shows the best value when, uh, when I do the screening. These guys, they do uh, packaging made out of uh, molded fiber, which is made of recycled paper. So it fits all these uh, ESG criteria for a good world going forward, including the X. The total market, if we came into a situation where all X were packaged in molded fiber packaging, would be 200 uh, facilities on a global basis. Hartmann, they're one of the biggest. They've got 40% market share in Europe, 20% uh, share in the US. A, depending, it's a little bit more difficult about Latin America, but uh, probably around 30% as well. And they've got 12 factories. So there's huge potential for uh, Hutamaki, and, uh, which is the biggest competitor, and for Hartmann to build out uh, on a bigger scale going forward. But just a little bit about the company itself. Established, they used to do paper bags, and then they went in to make machines to make paper bags, and then they developed into making the egg trays made of uh, molded fiber that you know from the supermarket. And they've been doing this year after year, and they listed in 82. So, and last year, the, the business is basically structured as uh, Europe sales, a little bit more than half, 40% plus in the US, and then machine sales with, where they disclose the, the, um, the uh, revenue line, but not the EBIT line. So I made that myself. And they will never say if it's correct or not correct. So it's, my estimate is that they have a much better profitability in the selling machines and parts to the, the, the uh, customers or in the areas where they do not have their own facilities. So uh, the machine bit is the most profitable one, and profitability quarter on quarter depends a little bit on how the machine orders are being executed. But otherwise, it's, uh, it should, they should benefit as the machine business make them, uh, it works as a trailblazer into new markets like uh, the Middle East and parts of Asia. Low, I mean, this just is a map of uh, where they are. I don't want to spend too much time in there, but this one is more interesting. This is uh, as far back I could get data to for, for, since 93. They had an expansion into the Asian and Latin region. It actually worked quite nice, as I can show on the stock price. It worked nice for perception of the company. But the yellow one where it took a significant dip in the early uh, 2000s, the expansion went pear-shaped. They cleaned it up went back to the core, which is Europe, and the facility in Canada, and then added the, the uh, US facility a few years ago and bought some assets that sold in Latin America. They actually bought them back uh, also in 2015, hence the jump uh, in revenues. The ambition from the company is to have EBIT margins between 12 and 14%, but just to be cautious, I always take the lower end of that band, so I factor in 12% going forward and then some pretty simple assumptions on the overall growth of uh, X to kind of generate a picture of where's the uh, revenue lines going. But it could be lifted more by the uh, plastic ban in the EU that was imposed last week. Hard plastics, uh, forks and knives and all that cutlery, 
is, uh, I don't know when it's going out, but it's going out pretty soon. Uh, and this will extend into all kinds of hard plastic. And if you live in the UK, Portugal, and Italy, when you buy X, you probably buy it in hard plastic packaging. So that will be part of the past uh, five years from now. That should help the business. The stock price over the last 30 years has been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, you see the, the enthusiasm among investors when they moved into high growth Asia in the, in the early 90s. It completely faded as uh, profitability didn't show up in the same extent as the enthusiasm, so that kind of disappeared. And in the, after the financial crisis, they cleaned up. The Tornico family, which is a, that's a privately owned conglomerate, they accumulated 68% uh, of the shares. The thing is, uh, Bruno Hartmann, since I uh, thought out, uh, suggest this one as, a, as an investment, is that the stock price actually took a big dive last year. This is uh, related to the exposure in Argentina, where the currency collapsed due to IFRS 15 or 16. You have to uh, treat it in a completely new way, basically saying it doesn't exist. So they removed uh, close to 40 million kroner out of EBIT. They took a, and going forward, Argentina is not going to show up anyway, and they're only in the cash flow statements if there's money coming out of Argentina. But uh, they also took a restructuring cost of 35 million. That obviously will not repeat itself in, the, in this uh, 2019. And finally, there was a legal settlement about some power, surplus power they sold to a community in Denmark where there was arbitration on how much they were uh, allowed to get or not. So this is the shareholder structure. It's, you know, six, it's not the biggest company in the world. They've got a market cap of one and a half billion Danish. So with 68% or 69% on one hand, the liquidity is not the best in the world. But Lenebo Funder uh, flagged a few months back that they had 5%. For those that attended the Nordic Value Conference last year, the last speaker was Carsten Dean, and he's running the uh, Lenebo Funder. So we didn't mention Bon Hartmann last year, but he's accumulated a nice stake in there. Otherwise, it's a non-institutional book and primarily in private individuals, a lot of the former employees are holders, and they own the shares primarily due to the dividend. The AGM is next week, and I go every year. It's quite interesting, AGM, but they all just come there to get the uh, dividend and a cup of coffee afterwards. For the um, financials, I don't know if you can see it down there, but I model it pretty simple. This is the short version of the financials. They've got a uh, return on equity, if you average it out, is on the good side of uh, 20%. I see the one-offs that occurred in 2017 and 18 are not being repeated in 19, so we should have the opportunity at least to have a little bit of a jump in profitability, hence the uh, higher return on equity uh, in 19 and going forward. And on valuation, uh, it's EV EBIT at nine times, so it qualifies when I screen for things that are uh, cheap or not expensive vis-a-vis -vis the growth rate. So on those metrics, it's okay. And if I'm wrong, at least for the next one or two years, I get the four or five percent dividend pickup every year. That's competitive to not being invested at all. So the triggers I see is the, uh, as I mentioned before, the reporting structures or the reporting for this year will be improved simply because the one-offs do not occur once more. There's no analyst, analyst coverage in this one. So uh, you don't find any consensus. And if you find consensus, it's uh, ABG securities that occasionally make a report on it, um, but it doesn't show up in FactSet and Bloomberg, as far as I know. I don't have Bloomberg anymore, but it, normally there was no estimates in there. Another trigger that will take a while to work out, but it could give a sentiment trigger in the shorter term is the uh, plastic directive that was announced last week, I mentioned before. And then it's increased utilization of the US facilities in, um, I showed it on the map, it's in, um, not Minnesota, it's a little bit, it's closer to Chicago and where you have all the hens and chickens for the New York markets, etc. They have one production line going 
for the time being, but the, the, the structure itself can take four production lines. So there's actually quite a lot of expansion opportunity without that much more CapEx on the um, US facility. And on the ESG thing, or on the valuation thing, it's uh, with a 5% dividend yield, and I think it should be trading at 10 times EV EBIT. So in 2021, numbers from this slide, I get to a target price of 385, and that's a 33% upside for a moderate growth stable earner. It's, it's, you know, it's a boring company, it's just ick packaging, but it's uh, sometimes Warren Buffett like these things. On the risk side, uh, these are just the normal risk factors I run through. Operational risk is input prices for, for uh, recycled paper and energy. That is volatile, and it's not always you can put it onto the buyers of the egg packaging, the supermarkets, etc., because it's longer term contracts. There is in the contracts opportunity to adjust, but uh, there's a time lag in there. So you could have quarterly miss up or impacts that uh, could surprise some investors. Uh, market risk is pretty low. There's, uh, the demand is non cyclical, even though in, in, in uh, economic downturns, people may eat more or less the same amount of eggs. There was a uh, kind of some kind of disease breakout in Holland, either it was last summer or the summer before, that created a little bit lower demand for two months and then it normalized again. On the competition side, in Europe at least, uh, Bon Hartmann, they've got a 41% market share. Hutomeki has got uh, a 40% market share, and the rest is a lot of smaller operators. Um, so it's pretty, it's not a duopoly, but it's pretty close to a duopoly. Financial risk is low. The regulatory risk is low, as I see it. I couldn't figure out, I can't figure out. Valuation risk is low, and when it comes to ESG, it should score pretty well if there was any, any ESG scoring systems covering it, but uh, the ones I use do not cover it. So I do my own, and I think this is okay due to the CO2, the recycled paper, the protein demand going forward, which is better CO2 footprint than the other ones, as I mentioned in the beginning. So it should have a pretty high score on the ESG side. And that kind of concludes. And just one last thing. Those guys are the, the youngest guys in Tornico. He uses the same hairdresser as the X. And then he's got some really uh, charismatic glasses. So he looks uh, pretty fun. Any I mean, this is egg packaging. It looks like it would be a completely commoditized business. How do they earn 20% returns on equity? Like, what's happening that makes that possible? Because there's no one else. Uh, there's a uh, Hutamaki doing it in Europe. In the US, most eggs are packaged in plastics and uh, cardboard boxes. So the, the breakthrough would be a consumer push in the US to have more uh, demand for, for eggs in, pack, in, in molded uh, fiber packaging. And that's more ecological. So if you take supermarkets like uh, Sprout Farmers and uh, Whole Foods, I mean, those kind of guys would be the one that push the demand, or it would be coming from that side that it would be push demand in the US. Obviously, you can, um, uh, it's, it's not easy to make, but, uh, and they make the machines. So in all the regions where they um, could be exposed to competition, like the US, they're not selling the machines to anyone else. So it's, so it's the machines that's making it difficult to enter this market? No, you, you need to have uptime, which is uh, on the north side of 95% uh, just produce. You need inventory, they're quite bulky, and you need uh, distribution fast. So it's, uh, it's not that simple as just uh, producing a cardboard box and then send it out somewhere. That's why they can take these margins. And as far as I've heard, there's no pushback from the customer side on their margins or profitability. Because it's, it's, if you look at the capital employed, it's pretty low. Inventory is 10% uh, of revenue. Working capital is 10% uh, of revenue. So it's, they've got a very high turnover of the, uh, the assets. Mm 